Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. So spoke the master of the English language, William Shakespeare. People in love do many strange things, but none so strange as the mystery of love itself, a passion that can be neither defined nor analyzed, weighed nor measured. Love's causes can never be known, only its consequences. It is a force so powerful it can move mountains or make time stand still. Alice, Alice, I'm so desperately happy. Oh, Edgar, why do you say desperately? Well, I don't know, because I'm afraid, I guess. Darling, surely you don't doubt my love. Well, I'm trying not to, believe me, but well, it's all so perfect now. Can it really stay this way forever? Our mystery drama, Hope Springs Eternal, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Court Benson and Anne Williams. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Moderation in all things, counseled the wise Aristotle. Certainly grief and pain in the extreme are to be avoided at all costs. But what of happiness? If asked, we would probably say that nothing could be better than perfect bliss. Yet why, then, do we so often cripple our own best hopes with doubts or jealousy and realize what we have done only when it's too late? This is a story of love, and it begins, of all places, in the dusty archives of a small New England fishing village. My name is Alistair Hodge. I'm a professor of history with a special interest in folklore, which is to say the legends and superstitions of ordinary people, which is to say people like you and me. Recently, I spent some time in a small seacoast town north of Boston, poring over old diaries, family records, and so forth. I'd come upon nothing unusual until on the final day of my stay there, or... What was to have been my final day? Sorry, Mr. Hodge, but it's closing time. Oh, thank you, Reuben. Come to release me from my labors for another day, huh? That's my job. Well, what's the weather been like today? You haven't looked out the window since this morning? Oh, once I become absorbed in these old documents, I lose all sense of time. I guess you'd call it a labor of love. What's the matter? Did I say something wrong? No, no. Well, we all have our abiding passions. Mine is folklore. I'd gladly plow through an entire library just to turn up one new folk remedy for a snake bite or one old wives' tale. Is that so... so difficult? Well, it is indeed when you've read as much as I have. But there's a kind of faith that keeps me going. A, a faith that, well, someday I'll stumble across something truly astonishing. And this hope, it makes you happy? Well, I suppose an analyst would say my work is just a substitute for human companionship. Uh, you're not married, eh? Well, there, uh, there, there was a woman who loved me once, or said she did. I found it difficult to believe. I don't know why. In any case, she eventually married someone else. 
But that was a long time ago, and... But it doesn't matter now. Doesn't it? Now, Reuben, don't tell me you're a sentimentalist. No, no, I believe in nothing you can't put between two slices of bread. More's the pity. Well, see you tomorrow morning as usual. No, I, I believe I'm finished. Unless there's something you haven't shown me. No, no. Well, I, I, I'll just let you out. Reuben, aren't you going to answer the phone? What? Oh, yes. Hello. Oh, hello, Miss Pennington. No, I haven't seen him. Yes, everything's ready. Just as you ordered. Yep. Yeah. Goodbye. Uh, I'll just let you out, Miss Hart. Reuben, was that the same woman who called you yesterday? Oh, I suppose. And the day before? In fact, every day for the past two weeks? Much longer than two weeks, Mr. Hodge. Always at precisely five o'clock. And always you, you you seem to have the precisely the same conversation. Do we? I don't know. Might I be so bold as to inquire? It's, it's a private matter, Mr. Hodge. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive my curiosity. Well, <laughs> that's your job. My abiding passion. Well, goodbye, Reuben. And thank you for your cooperation. Uh, Mr. Hodge, Professor, do you believe in the supernatural? The supernatural? What an odd question. Well, you devoted your life to it. Oh, I see. No, Reuben, I don't. We simply use the supernatural to explain those things for which no rational cause has yet been found. But how can we be so sure what's true and what isn't? We see, the one thing Western men cannot abide is mystery. We'll go to any lengths to comfort ourselves with explanations, even so far as self-deception. Do you really think it's that simple? Well, we can only believe in what we experience with the five senses. Yeah? What about what we experience with the heart? What? Reuben, you are a sentimentalist. Now don't laugh, Mr. Hodge. I've got to tell someone... Tell me what? Well, you say it's difficult to find anything new in your researches. Well, if you promise me not to put this in one of your books, I can tell you the most remarkable story you've ever heard. What good's a remarkable tale if it can't be published? Well, you'll understand when I've told you. Mr. Hodge. Well, I can certainly see what the weather's like today. I think there's going to be a storm. Yeah, just like that day so many years ago when it all began. Oh, yes, the story. But why did you insist we meet here on the beach? Surely you didn't think I'd have a tape recorder in my pocket, did you? I wanted you to see the house. Y you mean that mansion over there beyond the dunes? Yeah, it was built in 1692. <laughs> Looks deserted. The last people to live there were the Penningtons, Edgar and Alice Pennington. They were a young couple, wealthy, from Boston. They were newlyweds, hadn't been married more than two weeks, and I'd never seen a more devoted couple, despite Mr. Pennington's fears. Fears? He was a man struggling to find faith, Mr. Hodge. Faith and hope. You sound as if you knew them well. I was a servant in the house. It was 1942, during the war. Edgar, good afternoon, dear. Hmm? Oh. oh, hello, darling. Looks like we're in for quite a storm. Mm. A real nor'easter. <laughs> Do they really use that expression here? Oh, oh, yes. I thought it was only in books. Edgar, I think this little village is the most enchanting place on earth. Uh, do you really? This old house. Oh, what a lovely place for a honeymoon. You really like it here? Oh, yes. <laughs> now, come. You told me this morning you had a surprise for me. What is it? You do like this place, then? The uh, village, the ocean? Mm, I could wish for better weather. Oh. The storm will pass. Yes, like everything else. 
it, girl? What's the matter? Oh, I don't know. These these thoughts keep going through my head. Thoughts? Doubts. Doubts, doubts. Oh, darling, about what? About everything. The, the war, the future, us. Us? But that's silly. Why? Everything is so perfect. We're married at last until death do us part. Yes, I know, I know. I should be happy, but I can't help it. The, the, the happier I am, the more I feel a kind of dread. Oh, dear. I know it's silly. But whatever is there to be afraid of? That it won't last. That it can't last. But why not? Well, why should it? Nothing else does. Nothing else ever has. Is it because your own parents were so terribly miserable? They started out life together so happy. Just like us. Oh, darling. What can I do to reassure you? There's never been anyone else but you. So how can you be so sure I'm really the right person for you? Edgar, if you don't stop this, I'll begin to tease you. No, no, please. I need you, Alice. I know. I'll ring for that young man you've hired. What's his name? Uh, Reuben. Reuben. I'll have him lay the fire and bring us our tea. And then you can tell me your surprise. No. No, uh, let's take our walk first on the beach. Today? <laughs> With that storm coming up. I need something to relieve this pressure on my on my heart. Uh, maybe the wind and the rain. Well, that's what it is, the weather. It's this miserable day that's got you so depressed. No, no, it's not that. It... Well, it depresses me. I suppose I'll always be a city girl at heart. Do you, do you mean that, Alice? <laughs> it doesn't matter. We'll be back in Boston in a few days. Come. Tell me your surprise. Well, uh... I... I bought this house. Bought it? Yes, you... Well, you were so ecstatic when we arrived. I, I, I thought you liked it. Oh, oh yes, I, I do. I, I mean, it is... Quaint in a rather overwhelming kind of way. So old. You see? It's beginning already. The disintegration. Oh, darling, now don't be silly. I, I'm sure I can get used to it. You shouldn't have to get used to anything. But nothing's perfect. Except our love. Oh. Alice, if you really meant that. I do, Edgar. Please. Come. We'll go for a walk if that's what you want. Storm or no storm. Oh, I hope you're right, dear. That it's just a mood, but I've had these doubts all my life. Then I'll help you to change. If only you could. But how? By loving you. By having faith in you and, and teaching you to have faith in me and hope in our wonderful future together. Oh, my darling. I'm so happy. I must... I must get out. Away from this house. I feel like throwing myself into the surf and... and letting it dash me against the rocks. Oh, dearest, let me just give Reuben orders to have things ready when you return. I'll... I'll, I'll wait for you on the dunes. Oh, please, stay where I can see you. Yes, yes. You are all right, aren't you, Edgar? What? Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Alice, you... You will help me. You won't lose patience with me, no matter what happens. Oh, but what could possibly happen, Edgar? We're man and wife now. Where you go, I go. It's as if... as if we occupied the same space. That's what I want to believe more than anything else in the world. You will, dear. In time. Oh, uh, Reuben, uh, yes. Well, what did you want, ma'am? What? Oh, would you see that the fire is lit and that the tea service is ready for us when we return? It's a bad day for a walk. I know, but Edgar... Uh, Mr. Pennington isn't feeling well. He thought the storm might distract him. He's just nervous. Newlyweds always are. Look at him, standing there on the dunes, outlined against that terrible sky... Oh, there's a torment in his soul as fierce as those clouds. Sometimes I feel like I don't know him at all. If only...
only I could be certain he really loved me. I think he does, ma'am. Do you? As soon as I get to the top of the, of the dune. Uh, Edgar, I, Edgar. Uh, he, he's gone. Gone. Were Edgar's doubts fatal after all, in spite of Alice's reassurances? The poet says the course of true love never did run smooth. But how true can a love be that gives up so easily? Well, we mustn't get ahead of ourselves. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Anyone can be tormented by doubts and fear for the worst. Often it is only by a kind of blind faith that we keep going at all. And when the situation's darkest, that's when this faith comes in most handy. That's exactly how it happened, Constable. When I reached the crest of the dune, Edgar had vanished. Uh, men don't just vanish into thin air, Mrs. Pennington. Is there any reason why he might have wanted to leave you? You mean abandon me? Well, we've only been married two weeks. And Edgar was a moody person. Uh, uh, how do you mean? Oh, uh, he was afraid it wouldn't last. What wouldn't last? Oh, love. It was as if he had difficulty believing we could be happy. He, he was tormented by doubts. Mm. Well, that does raise another possibility, Mrs. Pennington. What do you mean? That your husband uh, took his own life. How not, dare... not, not just a moment. That beach stretches for a mile in either direction without so much as a piece of driftwood to hide behind. Yet you say it was less than a minute between the time he disappeared over the dune and you reached the spot where he'd been standing. Well, it may have been a little more than a, a minute. A spot from which you could survey the entire length of the beach. Now, where else could he have gotten to in that period of time? 4.37, the time of his disappearance, the ocean was at high tide, a mere 40 yards from the dune. The surf was up, making visibility no, difficult. No, no, Edgar would not have killed himself. Forgive me, Mrs. Pennington, but how can you be so sure? Because he loved me. He wouldn't do that to me. Well, yet you did say he's been moody, restless. I didn't say restless. You're putting words into my mouth. Mrs. Pennington, did you know that Edgar's father committed suicide? What? Oh, no, I, I didn't. Edgar never told me that. But anyway, what of it? I mean, suicide isn't hereditary. No, but insanity is. What? Edgar's father was certifiably insane at the time he took his own life. How do you know all this? Oh, I knew the whole family, Mrs. Pennington. They used to come here on holiday. Here? Mm -hmm. In fact, they used to rent this very house. They did? Now, Reuben Thompson tells me not three days ago, Edgar bought the place. Is that true? Y yes. A strange act for a man trying to escape from his past, wouldn't you say? Edgar did not commit suicide. And he will be back. You seem very certain of that, Mrs. Pennington. There was a perfect love between us. Was her faith justified? Did Edgar turn up? Uh, not in those next few days. Uh, I stayed with her. That is, someone had to, you understand. She was beside herself with grief. 
A few people had died in the storm, their bodies washed ashore here and there. I went to see them all, but none of them was Edgar. Well, of course, some bodies are never found. Some bodies, that's true. Things went from bad to worse. Mrs. Pennington's hysteria ebbed, and she began to slip into a kind of a indifference. But she refused to let me call a doctor. She didn't want others interfering. She insisted this was something between her and Edgar. I don't know what would have happened if she hadn't received a visit from that man. What man? Mrs. Pennington? Yes. I'm Captain Reynard. I'm with United States Intelligence Operations. Yes. A constable, Jonathan Barnes, reported your husband's disappearance to us. He had no right to do that. This is wartime, ma'am. Something like this cannot go uninvestigated. Something like what? May I come in? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, please have a seat, Captain. You seem remarkably composed. I'm very tired. One does need to take a rest, even from one's grief. But uh, do you have some news for me? I, uh, I have some questions I'd like to ask you. Oh, well, by all means. Are you aware that there are German U-boats patrolling the waters off our coast? I know it's not very patriotic of me, Captain, but... But what? I've been so distraught by my own private grief that I've quite lost interest in the war. I really don't care who wins. Oh? Did your husband share your sentiments? Edgar was intensely patriotic. It bothered him immensely that he wasn't fit for active duty. Not active duty, perhaps. Because of a bad leg. He'd taken a fall from a polo pony. What do you mean? Mean? You said not active duty. How much did you know about your husband's work? Oh, I have no head for business, Captain Raynard. Did you know he was working for civil defense? Uh, yes, but that was only part-time. And did you know that he had clearance, top security clearance? No. Well, of course, he never talked about it. He was, he was very scrupulous, very patriotic. I told you. A patriotic, yes, but to which side? What? We've run a rather thorough check on your husband, Mrs. Pennington, and there is strong evidence which suggests he may have been a German agent. A German agent? Oh, that's impossible. Just how well did you know your husband, Mrs. Pennington? What do you mean? Well, you'd only been married for two weeks at the time of his disappearance, and you'd met him only three months before that. It was love at first sight. Hardly a sound factual basis for a marriage. Constable Barnes said you told him your husband had been moody. That had only to do with us. He worried about the future. I'm sure he did. Our future. More than anything else, I was determined to persuade him that he didn't have to worry anymore. He was going to be happy. We were both going to be happy. And I know I would have succeeded. I'm sure you would have, Mrs. Pennington. Did you know that on the evening of his disappearance, our sonar detected a U-boat less than a mile off this very beach? What? Did you know that your husband had access to the plans for our entire coastal defense? No. And that there was a leak in the Civil Defense Bureau where he worked? No. No, I didn't know any of those things, Captain Raynard. I only knew that Edgar loved me and that he was trying desperately to trust in his life. Please, Mrs. Pennington, I'm sorry. I see I was wrong. But perhaps it does set your mind at rest to know that there is a possible explanation for his disappearance. Well, Edgar has not disappeared. W what did you say? I, I mean, he isn't gone. I, I can feel him here with me right now as if he were in the room at this very moment, trying to speak to me, and I can't hear him. I'm sorry I disturbed you, Mrs. Pennington. If you'll excuse me, I, I should leave. Yes, I, it's nearly five. Time to lay the fire and prepare our afternoon tea. Reuben. Ma'am? Um, uh, please show this gentleman to the door. 
Still, Mrs. Pennington, it should be some comfort to realize that when the war is over, your husband might return or send for you. How little that man knows about love. Oh, Reuben. Dear Reuben, I don't know what to think anymore. Sometimes I feel as if I never really knew Edgar at all. Everyone is trying to take him away from me. Well, I won't let them. I won't let them do that. Reuben, you may bring us our tea. And did Edgar return after the war? Would I be going now to lay the fire and set out the tea if he had? You mean that for all these years... Every day. And every evening. She telephones to see if he's returned. <sighs> I've heard about the power of love, but never anything like this. Not love, Mr. Hodge. Hope. Mrs. Pennington? Yes, Reuben? It's time for dinner now. Aren't you going to come down? Just a few more minutes. Well, it's gotten dark. I can still see. You spent every waking hour up here on the widow's walk for the last six months. Surely if Mr. Pennington were going to return... He will return, Reuben. I've told you that. It's not summer anymore. Looking at that sky, I'd say we're just about due for the first storm of winter. Nevertheless, I'll keep my vigil here just as the wives of the fishermen used to watch for their men at sea. Finally, though, her grief got the better of her. Her faiths never wavered, not from that day to this. But she could no longer bear to remain in that house with its brief memories and unfulfilled dreams. She left that winter and moved back to Boston. So Mrs. Pennington never regained her sanity. Uh, who said she was insane? Well, she has you light the fire and set out tea every evening. I'd certainly call that obsessive. You haven't told me which explanation you believe, Reuben. Did Edgar drown himself, or was the captain right about his being a German agent? I never believed either one of them. No? No, not for a minute. Well, why not? Because of Mr. Pennington's game leg. He never could have descended the dune and crossed the 40 yards to the surf in the minute or so he took Alice, uh, I mean, Mrs. Pennington, to, to come into view. Alice? What? You called her Alice. I did. Why? Well, I guess I was a little in love with her myself then. Reuben, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Hodge. That I had something to do with his disappearance. But would I be telling you the story now if I had? But it's so frustratingly incomplete. A man vanishes without a trace. You've got to have an explanation for that, or it's hardly worth publishing. You gave me a word, Mr. Hodge, that you'd not publish this. Uh, so I did, and I'll keep it. You've ruled out suicide and wartime intrigue. What's left? In fact, how can he have disappeared, period? A crippled man on an open beach. That's just it, Mr. Hodge. He never disappeared at all. <laughs> There's a little of the madman and a little of the lover in each of us, goes an old Spanish proverb. Which of these ingredients is it that has motivated Alice Pennington's vigil for 35 years? Perhaps it's a mixture of both. Or perhaps there is really no distinction. We'll find out, we hope, when I return with our final act. Springs eternal in each of us for something or someone. Sometimes we'll even deceive ourselves, so great is our longing. But is it really deception? To paraphrase the poet, there is nothing possible or impossible, but desire makes it so.
You say Edgar Pennington never disappeared at all? He was right here, all the time. Where? Here. But I don't understand. Why did he vanish or, or whatever? And why did he never make himself known? Well, as to why it happened, I'm not sure. As to why he didn't make himself known, well, I think he has. Reuben, just what did happen? Well, <clears throat> about three weeks ago, just a week before you arrived, as a matter of fact, I was repairing the attic roof of the house there against the winter. I was tearing out some old shingles right under the eaves when I discovered a book. A book? People must have been through that attic hundreds of times and never discovered it. It was an old book, then? It was a diary, Mr. Hodge, kept by one of the daughters of the original owner, Elijah Cuthbert, the man who built the house nearly three centuries ago. Cuthbert? Naturally, with my interest in our local history, I thought this was quite a find. I forgot about my work and began to read it. It was standard enough fare until I came to the entry for April 11, 1692. Hmm. April 11, 1692. There was a skirmish with the Mabahasset Indians on the 7th of April of that year, but, but I don't recollect anything significant happening on the 11th. It was April 11th that Edgar Pennington disappeared. Well, yes, but that was 1942. On that day, the diary records the appearance of a strange man at the house, just about five o'clock in the evening. The time. He seemed confused by his surroundings and appeared to have no memory of recent events of that time. But this is impossible. Fortunately, Prudence, that's the girl who kept the diary, was very observant. She described the stranger's dress in detail... Pants made out of sailcloth and a thin jacket of shiny, unnatural material never before seen in those parts. In other words, Mr. Hodge, khakis and a windbreaker. And was that exactly what Edgar Pennington had been wearing when he vanished? You're trying to tell me that somehow Edgar Pennington was transported back through time to the year 1692? But that's science fiction. I'm telling you what I found. It's a free country. You can draw your own conclusions. Well, I must say that my first conclusion is that the diary is a fake. Well, it was mine, too. The book ought to be examined by experts. I am an expert, Mr. Hodge. Well, of course, I didn't mean to imply that... I've been the curator of the town archives for over 30 years... Laying fires and setting out tea in abandoned houses is only a sideline. Then I'm sure you can appreciate the necessity for tests. I've already done them. For the acid content? Yeah. Uh, and the paper? Handmade, 100% rag, watermarks, wire and chain lines, all there. And the ink? Made from iron gall. That diary is absolutely authentic. There's even mold in the leather. Uh, that couldn't have been forged. Oh, so Edgar Pennington was the victim of a time warp, hurtled back through two and a half centuries. And probably standing not half a dozen yards from Alice, as she called his name. Well, what did you do after you found the book? What do you think? I caught the next train to Boston to see Mrs. Pennington. At last, we had the answer to the mystery of her husband's disappearance. She'd lived like a recluse all these years, alone, miserable. I wanted to set her poor, tormented mind at rest. Yes? Mrs. Pennington? Yes? Who are you? <laughs> it's me, Reuben Thompson. <gasps> Reuben! <laughs> Well, forgive me for not recognizing you. That's okay. I'd have only known you by the name on the door. <laughs> Still as blunt as ever. Well, it has been a long time, but please come in. Yep. Oh, how surprising. We've talked every evening on the phone for 35 years, and 
Only now does it strike me that in all that time we've never seen each other. Not since the day I left. Yep. Thirty-five years. That life is so full of such wonderful surprises and expectations. I was just about to have some tea. Would you, uh... Uh, Mrs. Pennington. Rupin, why are you here? What's brought you to Boston? Uh, Will I... He's returned? You've seen him? No, no, I haven't seen him. It isn't? Oh, no. Has his body been found? No, 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 no. no, no, Nothing like that. It's... uh, Well, you see, I was repairing the attic uh, for the winter. I'm so relieved. You gave me a start. You know, Edgar was on my mind, as always. I was just reading Browning when you rang. Elizabeth, that is. I will not be accused of feminism, I trust, when I state the fact that she was a much better poet than her husband. (laughs) The sonnets from the Portuguese. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old grief. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. That's that's very pretty. (laughs) But, of course, he's not dead. No. I mean, what I came to... Do you take cream or lemon? Uh, What? Rupin, in your tea. Oh, I don't know... I mean, I never drink tea. Then I shall make the choice for you. Uh, lemon. And some sugar. <laughs> oh, how much I look forward to our conversations each evening on the phone. You do? <laughs> yes, brief as they are. Dear Reuben, you're the only friend I have. <laughs> Has my silliness become such a terrible imposition? No, 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 not at all. I've been more than happy to do it. For 35 years. Surely there were times when you wished yourself free of it all. Would it just a routine, Mrs. Bennington? Do you know the last thing Edgar did before he disappeared? He was standing at the very crest of the dune. I do remember it as if it were yesterday. And he turned to watch me as I approached. And he waved as if beckoning me to follow him. There was a hurt look in his eyes, as if he were afraid I might not. But at the corners of his mouth were the beginnings of a smile. A brave effort to overcome his fear once and for all and accept our happiness. And that's why I know he's never left me and why I know he'll return. There's so much to look forward to. (laughs) Oh, oh, forgive me. Here I am prattling on without letting you get a word in edgewise. Now, you came to tell me something. Yes. Yes, I did. Well, then, what is it? Oh, there's nothing wrong with the house, I hope. Well, I I was up in the attic, you see. Yes, working on the roof, you told me. And... And... And I found... That it's going to require about fifty dollars to repair it. Is that all? Oh, but you could have written me for the money. You sure there's not something else? You, you seem upset. No, no, no. Thank you for the tea. What's that you've got there? Uh, what? Oh, that book. Oh, it's just something I picked up in town. An old diary of sorts. Something to read on the train home. Oh, and I thought maybe you'd brought me a present. (laughs) Well, Reuben, dear Reuben, goodbye. Bye. Reuben, I really am quite mad, you know. And that was it? You left without telling her? Well, it wasn't up to me to destroy her hope. But the truth... The truth, Mr. Hodge, was that as I sat there and watched her talk, she seemed to grow younger and younger before my very eyes, as if time hadn't passed at all. 
And if time can stand still for 35 years, why not for three centuries? Are you sure that was the only reason? What do you mean? Well, the phone calls. Well, who knows why we do what we do. Anyway, you see now why the story must not be published, of course. At least not in Mrs. Pennington's lifetime. But you haven't finished. Finished? The story, the stranger in the diary, Edgar Pennington or whoever he was. Whatever became of him, does the diary say? Well, the Cuthbert family took him in and tried to make him feel as much at home in those familiar, strange surroundings as possible. He remained there for the entire summer. But they saw very little of him, for he spent all his waking hours on the widow's walk. Like Alice Pennington. Always preoccupied, as if waiting for something or someone. The diary records a deep sorrow, as if he were suffering an unbearable loss. <sighs> the cruel betrayal of fate. Like the betrayals he'd endured all his life. Or a fulfillment. For they were together, in a way. And then? One day, he quite abruptly announced his departure for Boston. When the family pressed him for an explanation, he'd, he'd say only that the person he was waiting for was no longer there. He left, and they never saw him again, nor even heard a further word of him. And that's the end of the story. I don't think so. You see, the date of the entry which records his departure was November the 9th. That's the same day when, two and a half centuries later, Mrs. Pennington left the house herself. And went to Boston. Forever. <laughs> trick of fate or a fulfillment. Who knows? Perhaps Edgar Pennington would never have been happy in this life. Perhaps he would have lived fitfully, waiting for the disappointment he had experienced so often before. Who are we to say? But what of Reuben's decision not to tell Alice Pennington about the diary? A word on that in a moment. Was Reuben's act of concealment selfless or selfish? He certainly loved Alice Pennington and would wish for her happiness. But what about his own happiness in the expectation of her phone calls each evening? Only one thing seems certain. As long as there is room for hope, can any story be said to have ended unhappily? A final thought on time travel. Is it really only science fiction? I don't know, but I can say this. Compared to the complexities of human motivation, is the idea of time travel really so astonishing? Our cast included Court Benson, Ann Williams, Robert Maxwell, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear